and welcome to Science Pub. My name is Stephanie Coleman and I am the Community Education Manager at the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History and Sea Center. Welcome to your September Science Pub. We first and foremost want to thank Dargans for the 12 years of ongoing support for this free public program. As you well are aware that we are not there currently, um, we are virtual and we're gonna be virtual for a little while. So we are really pleading that you support local, um, not only just Dargans, um, but any of the local businesses that you really enjoy. I think we're all in this for the long haul. So if that means supporting your local museums um, by, you could get a membership to the Museum of Natural History. We have a, a large number of amazing programs that we're launching this fall. Um, you can talk to your teachers and have your, your teachers and kids sign up for our virtual field trips. So our school and teacher services program um, have launched virtual field trips. We have adult wizarding camps coming up, um, Halloween theme programs, uh, we have a lot, a lot of fun things going on. Um, so if you're wanting to try something new and uh, put some money and support us, um, please go ahead and join us for any of those virtual programs. They're going to be fantastic. Um, another way you can support us is by clicking the link that I just posted onto the chat, which is simply to donate. Um, and that can help you with your taxes. So um, donate and help the museum out. We all need help right now getting through um, this pandemic. Um, so thank you so much for your consideration with that. Um, and so we have Chris Coulter, who is um, our amazing AV guru. Um, and he normally helps us out uh, at our science pub. I don't think you've, have you ever missed a science pub, Chris Coulter? Uh, I, I have missed, I think, two science pubs in the, what is it, nine years, eight years? I think it's 12 years now. 12 years? <laughs> yeah. Whatever it is. <laughs> yeah, I think I missed two of them, uh, sadly. Uh, I, I hate missing them because I always learn something. It's a little bit like being in school, and that's the, that's the beauty of it. Um, Stephanie asked me if I would remember any stories about going back to school, and I'm sure that everybody out there has a wonderful story to tell. Uh, I remember living in Iowa City, Iowa, and I was but a wee lad. <laughs> I think I was in the first grade. And I was very excited to go back to school because I had a show and tell. My father had captured a kangaroo rat uh, in a live trap that he built out of a milk carton. And we had put that kangaroo rat in a cage and I was gonna take it for show and tell. And of course uh, I did <laughs> take it for show and tell. Uh, I had some, some help, but I had a little cage and I, I trotted it into class. And I was so excited to show everybody the kangaroo rat that, uh, and everybody wanted to see it, that I decided we, we'd leave it there. I would leave it there overnight. And the next day uh, I would take it home so that everybody could see it for the other classes. And the next morning I got to school and the, the teacher was horrified. The kangaroo rat was missing. Uh -oh. And we didn't know where that kangaroo rat had gone. But we all decided that year that there was a very smart kangaroo rat somewhere learning all of our lessons. Uh, and that's probably the sweetest uh, story I can remember <laughs> about going back to school. But it was great. And you accidentally released a rat in school? <laughs> yeah. Well, now, you know, it wasn't like one of those rattus rattus rats. It was really, a, it was a native, I guess, of Iowa. And it was, you know, I mean, it was a natural rat. It was a real, it, it happened to be caught in the barracks where we were living, but uh, uh, it, it was, it was not a, um, it was not one of those vermin rats. Yeah. You know, <laughs> anyway. Well, welcome back to school. I guess back that's a good school. thing about being virtual. You don't have to worry about kangaroo that's it. rats. <laughs> yes. So uh, anyway, uh, and it reminded me of, an, uh, of a joke that I, that I heard. Do you know why the broom got a poor grade in school? Well, because he was always sweeping in class. Oh, goodness. Um, 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 anyway, all right. Move it along. <laughs> move it on, move it on. <laughs> all right. So we have uh, joining us tonight, President and CEO, Luke Swetland. Um, and he is going to be introducing our esteemed speaker. Um, so Luke, take it away. Great. Thank you, Stephanie. I was just Delighted when Stephanie asked me to introduce our speaker tonight, Janet Dowling Sands. She's born in California, has a background in business, education, and philanthropy. 
She has had a lifelong interest in the cultural and natural history of the American West. She holds her degree in art history from UC Berkeley, and she's also the past president of the Santa Barbara Corral of Westerners International. Now, Jan has just recently authored her book on a mission, the real story of the California missions, and that's what brings us together tonight to get a sense of Janet's unique perspective on the history of the mission, the missions. It's really a perspective shaped by many years of her engagement with science and scientists as a board member of both your Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History and as a board member of the Institute of Human Origins at Arizona State University, which was founded by world-renowned uh, anthropologist, Dr. Donald Johansson. During Janet's many years as an active board member at the museum, she had a key role. She organized both the 2009 and the 2014 Santa Barbara Symposia on Human Origins, which brought together the leading anthropologists and archaeologists from all over the world to talk about the state of the art of how humans dispersed across this planet. Pretty amazing science happening right here in Santa Barbara. She was also deeply involved in the museum's strategic planning and master planning processes. Happily, she chaired the search committee that brought me to the museum in 2013. Yay. Janet was also the lead community par partner in a program called Science Matters, a 10 year long school community partnership that enabled our museum's educators to help teachers in local school districts get more comfortable bringing inquiry-based science education into their classrooms. Teachers weren't teaching science because they didn't feel comfortable about how to do it. That was our job with Janet's leadership to get them feeling comfortable. Oh, and in her spare time, Janet and her husband, Ed, oversaw the restoration of the historic director's residence at the museum over a two-year period. Janet is now an honorary life trustee at the museum. She's still very much involved. She never mails it in. She's clearly a big thinker, an energetic doer, and a great personal friend. So please join me in welcoming Janet Sands. Janet, take it away. Oh my goodness. Well, you only, you only get an intro like that if you're really old. <laughs> You've been around a while. Thank you and welcome everybody to Dargan's. I mean, this is also a picture of Dargan's. I think you just saw one. And this is virtual Dargan's. And of course, we really missed the real thing. But since we can't be there, we're still going to raise our glasses. I got mine. This is a nice Santa Barbara Chardonnay. And what I'd like to do is to thank and just really raise our glasses to just in honor of the extraordinary leadership and staff at the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History. They have faced this year's slightly major challenges with uh, creativity, with smarts, with energy, dedication to the museum's mission, and of course, a lot of very, very hard work. So to Luke, the entire board and staff and everyone associated with the museum, the volunteers, thank you. Hooray to all of you. And I'll take a little sip. Now, so, why history needs science. This is my topic for tonight. Or what I learned in my new gig as a history writer, well, trying to be one anyway. And from hanging out with all those mad scientists over the years. So first of all, let's remember that science is about all kinds of history. It's a history of the universe, of our planet, and all the species on it. And of course, our museum is devoted to natural history so we can really understand how best to protect and care for this beautiful and very special home of ours. Now, if this little talk were a book, I would have a theme quote. This is my theme quote, you can all see. And uh, we'll come back to this at the end. Now, history. My, my topic for today really isn't about my book per se. Maybe you'll be able to come and join me for another one of my talks about the actual content of my book. But this is my thought about history that I came to from writing the book. History seems to be a little controversial these days. And sometimes it's so controversial and uncomfortable that a lot of people would like to erase or rewrite it or you know, knock down some statues. But not to worry, that's nothing new. Humans have been doing this forever. 
one of the main points made in my book about California's colonial period, which, or mission era, which is one of those sensitive topics, is that we can think about history differently. We can, and often do, adapt the scientific method for the study of history, and we aim for a better understanding. So let's remind ourselves how the scientific method works. And this is from that 10 years with Science Matters. And this is what we tell kids. Um, you have to ask the right questions. You have to be curious. You have to gather evidence from multiple sources and analyze your evidence. You form a hypothesis, which is your story. You test your hypothesis and then you put it out there so that others can challenge your hypothesis. Now, science shows us that everything in the natural world is part of an interconnected system and that nothing can truly be understood when taken out of context. Of course, the same holds true of the people and events of history. They too must be understood in context. I just found this cool biodiversity slide. I just stuck it in there. <laughs> and of course, just like science, good history is about being curious and asking a lot of questions. If you Google funny science cartoons, you come up with a lot of stuff. <laughs> and it's about being open to new information here. <laughs> the system here, even if it proves your current idea is wrong. Now, when our friend, the paleontologist Jack Horner came to Santa Barbara and spoke to a bunch of kids at, oh, there at Fleischmann Auditorium, he gave this cool dinosaur talk. And then he said to the kids, so how many of you want to be scientists? And all the hands shoot up, of course. And Jack said, well, that's great. But you just have to remember one thing. If you're the kind of person who has to be right all the time, science may not be right for you. So I've learned that the very best scientists are not only willing to be wrong, they can get pretty excited when somebody else's new idea challenges theirs. And there you see Jack at the, on the di dino dig site. Um, so many years ago, we were out there digging dinosaurs with Jack, had our kids along, and somebody asked him, hey, so uh, this is a long time ago, back in the mid 90s. So did an asteroid kill off the dinosaurs? And he said, well, we don't really have any evidence for that. So I don't think so. Well, a few years later, somebody asked him the same question, and this was his answer. Yep, they found the crater. And by the way, if you want a fabulous science detective story, get T-Rex in the Crater of Doom. I was excited just recently to find a first edition. And then in 1997, well, this is dating ourselves, we were over there in France with Don Johansson, and uh, somebody asked him if Neanderthals and Homo sapiens interbred. Uh, we were on a trip to see the cave art, and we were drinking wine, and you know, we asked him that question. He said, well, we don't really have any evidence for that, so I don't think so. But then, uh, since the completion of the Human Genome Project in 2003, after Don made that statement, scientists can now, of course, extract, sequence, and analyze DNA even from ancient bones. It's sort of a 23andMe for fossils. This high-tech science provides very strong evidence that modern humans have indeed interbred not only with Neanderthals, but with the recently discovered Denisovans, named for the Siberian cave for a tiny pinky bone. Now imagine your pinky, it's like a tiny pinky bone fragment that some sharp-eyed archeologist found. And they sent it off to the Max Planck Institute in Leipzig. And when they examined it, it yielded the genome of a whole new human species, which they named the Denisovans. Pretty astonishing. So the Denisovans split off from the Neanderthals about 400,000 years ago and migrated across Asia. Their genetic legacy, like that of the Neanderthals, is with us today, found mostly in people who live in Australia, New Guinea, and parts of Asia. Now, new fossil discoveries hint that modern humans and Denisovans may have mixed their genes as recently as 15,000 years ago. And by the way, um, Svante Pabo uh, of the Max Planck Institute does come to UC Santa Barbara sometimes, and we heard him speak, and of course, he loves to ask the audience, so uh, who thinks they have Neanderthal DNA? Uh, Neanderthal DNA? And of course, he says, when he asked that question, all the women raise their hands and they say, well, my husband has it. Anyway, um, so, but so as he likes to say, it's usually not a good idea to make predictions, which always reminds me of Yogi Berra's famous saying, it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. So I had a lot of questions. Oh, and I loved, I just threw this in there because we were out with a friend, Ian Tattersall, who used to be the curator of anthropology at the American Museum of Natural History. Uh, and 
somebody asked him about his, uh, whether what he said when people said they didn't believe in evolution, this was his answer. I don't know why I threw that slide in there. Anyway, so in writing my book about the California mission era, I had a lot of questions. My first area of academic study was art history at UC Berkeley, and I'm glad that I wasn't asked about student stories from the 60s. Anyway, and I still do that, study art history. But exposure over the years to so much science, especially through this wonderful museum and the Institute of Human Origins, has given me many more places to look for answers. So I wanted to understand the missions in the context of global history. I wanted to understand much more about the native peoples of California, where their ancestors came from. I wanted to know why California wasn't settled by Europeans until more than 200 years after it was first discovered. Oh wait, I gotta go back because I'm not ready. Why are the missions located where they are? What was the real impact of European settlement on the native cultures and pre-contact environment of California and the mission era's legacy? And of course, if you're studying mission era history, you have to study wine, which is why the subtitle of my book is Wining and Dining Through History. So anyway, just as scientists try to answer questions about the natural world by direct observation, and by gathering evidence, here we are in a dino dig, that's Ed there digging away, and this is at a Diplodocus site in Livingston, Montana. And scientists uh, answer questions by collecting and organizing their data. I bet you know some of these people and I bet you recognize our CRC. They formulate their theories. There's Mr. Darwin. And of course, if you're a scientist, you have to test your hypotheses. And so I wish I could hear you all laugh. So historians try to piece together the story of our past by gathering research and digging up as many firsthand sources as possible, which is the historical equivalent of direct observation. And this is very important. You have to look at these sources in the context of their time. These are some of the sources I looked at when I was doing my book. You know, and if we really look at these and start asking questions, we're gonna learn a lot from history. And it really helps to get out there to see and feel it. And this whole project of mine started when Ed and I decided to go out and uh, just take road trips around California in our Airstream and see and paint all the missions and look what happened. And then sometimes we're lucky enough to be out on the mission trails. This is behind Mission La Parisma and we're out on the trail where this landscape is almost unchanged since the mission era. So here are a few of the big questions that I addressed in my book um, that science really helped me understand. First of all, why did Europeans arrival in the new world cause such a tragic collapse of the native populations? Now we all know it's disease, but it's estimated that 80 to 90% of indigenous people throughout the Americas died from diseases. The statistics, the statistics are really grim and they're shocking. They were shocking in those days too. Oops. Here we go. Spain's stated goal of converting the Indians to Catholicism and training them to be productive Spanish citizens may seem wrong to us today, but Spain had no intention of wiping out the native people of California. Although certainly the abuses of the Spanish conquistador class of the 1500s is a tragic exception to this, and believe it or not, and this is a good topic for another talk, the conquistadors were in violation of the strict laws imposed by both the uh, Spanish crown and the church uh, against abuse of Indians, believe it or not. Um, but anyway, we'll, we'll get to that another time. And those missionary padres who were unaffected for the most part by enlightenment era thinking, which was really coming to the fore, truly believed that they were saving souls. We have true believers today. So what happened? We know it was disease. We need to truly understand how this unfolded. Excuse me, I have my little system here. So I think one of the survey questions was, how many of you have heard about or read about the Columbian Exchange? Stephanie, did you get a response on that? Yeah. Well, it should okay. be in front of the people right now and we'll be able to see uh, their answer. Okay, well, we'll come back to that then because I've asked this question to my live audiences and it's, uh, it's interesting because a lot of people have not really um, heard of it. So we can take that off the screen if we wouldn't mind. Thank you. So what happened was about from 300 to 175 million, let's see. Uh, so Columbus's voyage of 1492 really kicked off the modern world in ways that he couldn't possibly have imagined. 
because from about 300 to 175 million years ago, all of Earth's land masses, as you learn in fourth grade these days, were joined together in the ancient supercontinent called Pangaea, which you see there on your screen. As Pangaea drifted apart to the world we have today, all the species that have been together suddenly evolved separately on these separate land masses of the Americas, Asia, Eurasia, Africa. And so, of course, they just evolved separately and didn't have any interaction with each other. What Columbus's arrival in the New World did was to change everything overnight. So Europeans' arrival here just brought together long isolated plants, animals, microbes, which traveled to the New Worlds on, onto the New World on Columbus's and other ships. And of course, they made the return trip back to Europe. And they were thrown together, all these species that had never been together for millions of years. And so this is what historian Alfred W. Crosby called the re-knitting together of Pangaea, and he called it the Columbian Exchange. It's a name that's stuck, and there's a lot of good books about it. So Europeans unwittingly unleashed these microbes from Eurasia and Africa onto a population that had never been in contact with them. It's what biologists call virgin territory, where there was no natural immunity. The resulting spread of contagion decimated Native American populations. It was a real demographic tragedy, resulting in an 85 to 90 percent reduction of the populations in the Americas. So if there was guilt, though, it was what one writer called inculpable 18th century ignorance. People then had very little idea about what caused disease or how it spread, and science had no prevention or cure. Another huge consequence, of course, of the Columbian Exchange was the environmental changes caused by the introduction of European food crops and herd animals. You see some of them listed here. For thousands of years, California's indigenous people had lived by exploiting a very resource-rich resource environment. They never had to develop settled agriculture as people did in the arid Southwest, where it wasn't quite so easy just to go pick food up off the ground. European crops and animals, however, changed that. They crowded out many native species and changed whole ecosystems here and forced native people to adapt to new food sources and life ways. Today, Pangaea has truly been renit by planes, trains, and automobiles, as has been pretty dramatically demonstrated by the global pandemic we're living with. But believe it or not, globalization has had its benefits as well as risks. For example, potatoes from the New World saved millions of people in Europe from starvation. Europeans and Africans were introduced to some favorites, chocolate, tomatoes, and corn, for example. California's signature agricultural products like citrus, wine grapes, olives, dates, came here from Eurasia via the Mediterranean and the Iberian Peninsula. And coffee, something almost no one seems to be able to live without today, except me, is from Africa. So why was this in my book on the missions? because I learned that it was the 21 Spanish missions established from 1769 to 1821 that brought the Columbian Exchange to California. Their huge agricultural operations supplied the presidios and the towns that grew up around them. They, they were really established to provide produce and products for these Spanish settlements because it was just really hard to get imported products here. And uh, this laid the foundation for modern day California's role today as a major food and wine producer. Now, as I touched on earlier, one of my big questions turned out to be a hot topic in science right now. Where did the first Californians come from, and what was California like before Europeans' arrival? You might wonder why this question pertains to mission era history. Um, I'll just refer to something that was written in 1960 by Father Maynard Geiger, who was a longtime archivist and pastor at Mission Santa Barbara. He wrote a little book called The Mission, uh, Indians of Mission Santa Barbara. In it, he said, it must not be forgotten that the true and original pioneers of this land were the Indians from whatever regions they came. Well, since he wrote that back in 1960, we've learned a lot about the origins of Native Americans, and it seems that we're learning something new every day. But let's back up a minute and talk about geography. California's north-south orientation and unsettled geology, as I write here, has created enormous diversity of terrain and ecosystems. We have beaches, deserts, mountains, a 450-mile-long central valley that is considered to be one of the most notable structural depressions on Earth. We have foggy coastal hills and one of Earth's five Mediterranean life zones. I'm sure you can all name the other four. 
which are biodiversity hotspots. And just as plant and animal species will adapt to and exploit every available environmental niche, human groups in pre-contact California and today adapted to a wide range of distinct climate and ecological zones. Now, in 1769, when Spain first established settlements in California, in Alta California, as distinguished from Baja California, it was the most diverse region in North America. About 325,000 people lived here in about 80 tribal groups, living in perhaps 1,000 distinct tribelets, speaking hundreds of mutually unintelligible languages, perhaps as many as a thousand. It takes a long time for such diversity to evolve. So here's the question again, how early did people first arrive in California in the Americas? Where do they come from? How do we find out? Today, DNA evidence confirms what's long been guessed by observation of the, just the physical similarities of Native Americans with Asians, that Native American Americans' ancestors came from Asia. But genetic analysis now reveals that early migrants to the Americas also carried European genes with them across the Asian continent. More about this amazing work in a couple of minutes. Now, for a long time before DNA evidence was even a dream, archaeological evidence, like the beautiful fluted stone points you see here in this picture that were found at Clovis, New Mexico, and other sites around the Americas, um, supported a, high, a widely held hypothesis called Clovis First. This theory proposed that the first Americans traveled here from Siberia over land um, through an ice-free corridor that opened up between the retreating glaciers. You see those red lines about 12,000 years ago, which is when the ice-free corridors opened up. But remember, if you're the kind of person who has to be right all the time, maybe you shouldn't go into the business of science. The first problem for Clovis first these days is that a lot of coastal and other sites have been discovered throughout the Americas that predate the opening of the ice-free corridor, like Monteverde, Chile, see down there at the bottom, and the Arlington Springs site on Santa Rosa Island, which was discovered by Phil Orr of this museum, I think in the 1950s, somebody can correct me later, and long studied by, of course, Dr. John Johnson here and his various teams. Further, other research has shown that it may have taken more than a thousand years after the ice melted for that ice-free corridor to, be pumped, to become uh, sort of repopulated, revegetated with the plants and animals that people needed to survive on what would certainly have been a very long, cold walk. But maybe some of those early arrivals didn't have to walk. So what happened is that in 2007, a team of scientists at the University of Oregon had done a lot of research and they proposed that starting at least 20,000 years ago, early mariners actually traveled here from Asia by sea along the coast, following what the team leader, uh, Dr. John Erlinson, called the Kelp Highway. Now, this theory makes a lot of sense. The kelp forest ecosystem was and is virtually the same all the way from Japan around the coast of the Northern Pacific and down the coast, western coast of the Americas all the way to Chile. For people who had learned to live, hunt, and fish along the coast, it was easy to migrate along this highway. John Johnson explained to me why. He said the kelp forest is just a great facilitator. A facilitator. It has a calming effect on wave action. The deep-rooted giant kelp provided whole fast for their canoes, like an anchor almost. And most importantly, it was rich in the food resources that they needed and already knew how to exploit. This is a cool kelp forest community slide that I found from some, one of our science lessons for kids. So, of course, this story is just unfolding. Since sea levels were about 400 feet higher, are they are higher now? They're higher now. They were 400 feet lower then than they are now. Uh, the Channel Islands, by the way, were once connected by a wide plain populated by pygmy mammoths, and you can learn a lot about that in the museum. So much of the evidence for these coastal people is probably underwater, which is considered one of the last frontiers for archaeology. One thing the evidence does make clear is that there were multiple migrations multiple waves of migration from Asia into the Americas over many thousands of years, both by land and by sea. We know from very recent archeological finds that at least two ancestral groups settled in Beringia for a time, that's the now submerged land that's between uh, Siberia and Alaska, um, before moving into North America. This is called the Beringian standstill. Other groups of people even decided to return to Siberia during a warm period. How do we know? 
both DNA and linguistic evidence reveals that the Nadine speaker, speakers of North America, these are the Inuit, Aleuts, Navajo people of the Southwest, share a genetic profile, not only with people who live in Siberia today, but with human ancestors found buried in Siberia. That's another big story. Now, science has really helped us to understand human prehistory, including where those first Californians came from. And this prehistory really helps us put our history into context. This map gives a rough overview, for example, of 200,000 years of modern human migrations. I think that's pretty cool. I'm, this, this is from the Khan Academy, and I added a few things on there, like Buttermilk Creek, the Chiquihuite cave that was found in Mexico that's recently been dated about 26,000 years ago, and so on. Now, as I mentioned before, genomics is really filling in the blanks of this story. Here are a few of the world-leading labs, I thought you'd like to see this, that are extracting, sequencing, and analyzing DNA from fossils. Look these people up. If you haven't already, you'll be amazed. This is Fante Papa, who we mentioned earlier, who heads the legendary Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Leipzig, Germany. This is Dr. David Reich, who's a professor of genetics at the Harvard Medical School. His teams have published DNA from the genomes of over 900 ancient humans, more than all the other labs combined. His ultimate goal is to find ancient DNA from every known ancient culture to build a genetic world atlas of humanity over the past 50,000 years at least. Now, here's another underachiever and someone who participated in our symposium in 2014. Dr. Eska Willersleff founded the Center for Genomics, Geogenomics, sorry, at the University of Copenhagen. Importantly, because extracting DNA from ancient humans can generate huge controversy, especially among mem members of Native American tribes who deeply believe in their own origin stories and really wish to keep them. And they hate to see ancient bones studied and analyzed. They want to have them repatriated and reburied. But Dr. Willersleff, like our own John Johnson, has stood out as a scientist who has gained the trust of Native tribes all over the world because of his respect for their beliefs and traditions. And uh, I can recommend a great podcast interview that I heard recently uh, with Eska Willersleff. If anybody's interested, just email and I'll let you, I'll give you a link. It was great. Now, remember the thing about multiple lines of investigation? Now, this is all super high tech, but many years ago, and this is another scientist, by the way, who participated in our, one of our symposia. Before we could analyze DNA, Dr. Johanna Nichols of UC Berkeley, a brilliant, she's called a maverick linguist, who doesn't like her own photo to be used because she travels as a single lady in dangerous places. She did exhaustive research on world languages, looking at grammatical building blocks rather than traditional language family trees that can only be traced back about 6,000 years. In 1998, of course, before you could sequence DNA, plotting these linguistic echoes, she proposed a timeline and created this map for human migrations around the world. This language map shows an enormous sustained wave of migrations starting about 50,000 years ago in Southeast Asia, moving ultimately across the Bering Strait and down the west coast of the Americas. Her map was published at a time to remember, remember when Clovis first was really accepted dogma, hence the maverick designation. It now strengthens the case for the first Americans being seafaring people following the Kelp Highway. In 2015, she published How America Was Colonized, proposing at least four distinct discoveries of the Americas beginning at least 24,000 years ago. Pretty cool stuff. Now here's another, and as it turns out, very related question that came up when I studied California's mission era history. Why was California, which seems to all of us to be pretty much the center of the world, nearly the last place on earth to be settled by the European colonial powers? I mean, didn't they wanna be in San Francisco or Silicon Valley? So, well, before planes, trains, and automobiles and the Panama Canal, California was actually more remote from Europe than Siberia. You can just see, I mean, you can imagine if you couldn't go straight through the Panama Canal, that was a long trip, no matter how you cut it. Let's add some oceanography to this story. The same prevailing winds and currents that created a kelp highway in the Northern Pacific and facilitated the early arrival of humans to the coastlines of the Americas many thousands of years ago, made it extremely hazardous for European explorers who ventured north from New Spain, present day Mexico. That's where Acapulco is, of course. 
so hazardous, in fact, that they didn't make a serious effort to settle Alta California for a long time, or for over 200 years after it was first discovered. It was first explored by Cabrillo in 1542, but not settled until the Portola Serra expedition of 1769. Not only did ships have contrary winds and currents to deal with, they had scurvy. Over half the sailors on Cabrillo's 1542 voyage, Vizcaino's 1602 voyage, and even Portola's ships in 1769 died of scurvy. Over half died of scurvy because those headwinds and southward trending currents added deadly months to their sea voyages. I was surprised to learn that during the age of exploration, this debilitating wasting disease claimed over 2 million sailors' lives, more than storms, shipwrecks, sea battles, and all other diseases combined. We now know the cause, of course. If you go for about three months without the vitamins that fresh food provides, your body loses so much ascorbate or vitamin C that it can't maintain the connective tissue and vital enzymes. And of course, if scurvy isn't treated, painful death ensues. It's pretty mystifying, though, that people kept figuring out possible cures and then forgetting them. As early as the 1500s, some ship captains noticed that there seemed to be a connection between eating fresh fruits and vegetables and scurvy. In 1753, a British naval surgeon named Dr. James Lind ran the first recorded clinical trial, something we've heard a lot about these days, in an attempt to find a cure for scurvy. He separated the sick crew on his ship into pairs, and he gave each pair one of the different proposed cures for scurvy. The pair that got the citrus recovered. The other ones didn't. Lind published his findings right away, but it took 42 years for them to be accepted. But even then, later in the century, sailors still resisted eating fresh fruits, especially sour ones. So sweetened concentrated lime juice was mixed with rum to make them drink it. And this concoction called grog led to the nickname for British sailor, which of course we all know is limeys. So if you want to order a grog or go mix one for yourself, you can do it later. Now, geology affects history a little bit. Here's something else I was curious about. Why were all the missions built on or near the earthquake faults, including the infamous San Andreas Fault? With devastating results, of course, as all the missions were built of unreinforced masonry, you know, adobe bricks and and clay tiles because it's what they had. Now, this is a cool picture just to show you a little of California's geology. That's the Carrizo Plain, as many of you may know. And that's the famous Wallace Creek offset. The San Andreas Fault is the straight horizontal line going through the center of the picture, of the big picture. And the two arrows point to the, how much the creek has been offset. And I'm sorry, I forgot to look up exactly how many years, but it's been in fairly, you know, with, before too many years passed, it was offset that much by movement along that fault. On the downhill side there is the Tordas, is the Pacific plate. On the other side is the North American plate. So if you want to put one foot on each plate, you can go up to the Carrizo plane and do that as we did. Now, so here's just some of the earthquake damage to the missions. Now, as we know now, our entire coast is a fault zone where the Pacific and North American plates crash together. The Spanish missions and presidios needed to see their supply ships coming. They needed to guard those important ports. They also needed reliable water sources, and water often follows the path of a fault. So there they are, on or near the fault. The Padres had no clue about earthquake-safe construction or plate tectonics, of course, but we know now. And this is, these are some cool pictures of the uh, earthquake retrofit, the seismic retrofit that was carried out at Mission San Luis Rey down in Oceanside. Basically what they do is drill through the walls and the whole mission, and they build this huge kind of reinforcing steel birdcage inside the adobe brick walls to hold the whole mission together. And it's now completed, and that's the beautiful mission after the retrofit. Now, finally, Let's take a quick look at how science and art together can illuminate history. Let's use the example of Monterey and its nearby mission San Carlos Borromeo. Monterey was, of course, an important harbor on America's Pacific coast, visited by ships from all nations, and it was, of course, the capital, the Spanish capital of Alta California. And among the ships that visited were ships of the scientific expeditions that were undertaken by the major sea powers during the mission era. And sometimes, of course, there were no brownie cameras in those days and no, you couldn't hold your iPhone up to take pictures. So this is a picture of Mission San Carlos. 
that was done by a French artist. In 1786, King Louis XVI of France commissioned a huge, lavishly equipped scientific expedition to explore the whole world. He wanted France to compete with England in Captain James Cook's extensive scientific explorations and, of course, their search for the Northwest Passage. The French expedition was led by Jean-Francois de la Galope, the Comte de la Perouse, who stopped at Monterey and visited nearby Mission San Carlos. The artist Duché de Vinci drew this fledgling mission, of course, and not our only surviving image of it. There you see the Indians and the Padres lined up to greet the visitors. It was a big deal when this ship came to visit because they didn't get a lot of visitors. And you know there were two priests and a few soldiers at, at each mission, so they were pretty thrilled to have visitors. So what happened was that um, La Perouse visited the mission and he left copies of all of his drawings and journals and then sailed off to the South Sea where tragically his whole expedition was lost at sea mysteriously. They, they may have found the wreck but everything was lost and all we have is what he sent home from Mission Carmel. So in response to the achievements of Cook and La Perouse, King Charles or Carlos III of Spain launched a five-year royal expedition to explore the world. At the time, Spain had the largest scientific budget of any European country. It was led by Captain Alejandro Malaspina, who had previously successfully circumnavigated the globe on a commercial expedition. They too stopped at Monterey, where his resident artist on board drew this picture of the Monterey Presidio. It's the earliest view of the Presidio. And then the artist's name was Jose Cardero. This is a picture of Malaspina, the captain of that uh, expedition, and Bustamante, who was his co-captain. And in 2010, I just read, Spain, uh, to honor this, they did an another major scientific circumnavigation um, with a huge ocean oceanographic vessels with 250 scientists on board. Now, finally, British Captain George Vancouver led a 1791 expedition. He was one of Captain Cook's midshipmen, by the way. He, this was a four-year long expedition, a scientific circumnavigation that visited five continents. And because they were using lime juice as a preventative for scurvy, all but six of his 153 men on board returned home in good health. This drawing of Mission San Carlos, slightly more developed than it was in Duché de Vinci's 1787 view, was made by the artist seaman, artistic seaman, John Sykes. And I thought you might like to see, this is Mission San Carlos Borromeo in the 1870 by itinerant artist Edward Fisher. You can kind of see the whole complex there. It hadn't totally fallen into ruin yet. And this is a great archival photograph of what it looked like in the late 1880s before it was restored. And this is what it looks like today, of course. Now, some thoughts on history. Here they come. Make connections. Historians, like scientists, have to gather facts from multiple sources to put a story together. Remember these images? California's hugely unsettled, varied terrain was a result of its position at the edge of the continent where major plates collide. These insights come, of course, from geology. This multiplicity of life zones, you can see in that central map, the California habitat regions, where species, including humans, occupy and defend their specialized ecological niches, resulted in the third map, the greatest tribal and language diversity in North America. Now, there are a lot of what ifs in history. Maybe this language map is a good hint about why the native people of California never formed a large civilization like the Aztecs or Incas. Powerful rulers, cities, and a priestly class have typically been the outgrowth of settled agriculture, which never happened here. So with no powerful rulers or coordinated military action, indigenous California was unlikely to launch large scale warfare against the European invaders. Now, when you're doing history, we have to look at the big picture, something we forget about a lot these days. And we have to understand the significance and inevitability, for example, of the Columbian Exchange. It was not only the last stop you know, in California of the Columbian Exchange. It represents settlement, you know, the, the last stop for modern humans coming out of Africa starting a couple of hundred thousand years ago. It was also the final phase of Spain's empire. It represents the opening of Pacific Rim trade to the world, a clash of enlightenment ideals with medieval thought is represented by the Franciscans who did find, found the missions and the blending of indigenous and European cultures. So in many ways, California is just a perfect example of the Columbian exchange. 
And of course, we have to consider context. Remember this map? Let's put European colonization of the New World into context, this sort of hot button issue today. Let's consider 200,000 years of modern human migrations out of Africa over the whole world. Humans have had an innate drive to explore. They've always done that. Our ancestors have done it for thousands, maybe millions of years, and now we're exploring space. And everywhere humans went, we impacted the environment and other species. But if we look at science, we're told a lot these days to look at science, but if we really think scientifically and are open-minded, we can understand a lot of things that don't come immediately to mind. We might realize, for example, looking at the work of Curtis Marion, the scientist who was the keynote speaker of our last symposium, that all humans on the planet are likely brothers and sisters in a huge and often contentious family. It seems likely that we all are descended from a population of less than 10,000 modern humans who survived on the southern coast of Africa and from there radiated out and populated the entire world. Every one of our long chain of ancestors, their discoveries, their beliefs, their triumphs, their mistakes, their, their, their dreadful things they did were part of human history. Was it all good? Of course not. Can we change it? No. Or can we only keep learning from our mistakes and learning from history and constantly keep trying to improve? Humans are doing this. I love this quote from Matt Ridley's The Rational Optimist. This is where it would be good to remember my theme quote. So I told you we'd come back to this. The real topic of this pub talk was that being curious about anything, even something as seemingly stodgy as mission history or fourth grade, can lead to, can lead to some pretty fascinating insights. That's why kids love science. It's good to ask a lot of questions. And I hope that you'll take advantage of some of the suggested itineraries in my book to explore California and look at these beautiful historic sites from the mission era with new eyes. It's a fabulous story. It's still being told. And maybe we can get together again and I'll show you some of the beautiful images from my travels with Ed. Now, thanks very much to everybody and thanks so much to my friends at the museum for giving me this opportunity to share it with you. Bye bye. Janet, thank you so much. That was wonderful. I really enjoyed, um, I think my favorite slide was the succession of the three California maps. Like, wow, that is <laughs> such a connection. Yeah, they'll go back um, there somewhere and go back to that anyway. Huh. But um, anyway, so I'm gonna so launch a poll, a poll while um, the questions start rolling in. Um, and so this is how many uh, California missions have you visited? Um, so we'll be able to see that. Um, so question and answer uh, portion has begun. You can use the button at the bottom of your screen to ask any questions. Also, while we have a little downtime, um, Janet's new book is for sale uh, at the museum's bookstore and our museum store. So it's online and in person. Um, so go ahead and grab that up. So let's see. Um, we're gonna end that. It looks like people have been to five to 10 missions. So not bad. Um, that, that was where we stood. And I've yeah. got to say that um, our, my favorite ones ended up being the ones that were, I was maybe least likely to visit in some sort of haphazard fa uh, fashion because they weren't on the beaten track. Like this, uh, this image here is San Antonio de Padua, which is actually on the Hunter Liggett Military Reservation up near Salinas. And that is maybe my favorite place to visit. It's beautiful. But yeah, great. <laughs> Um, and then just so uh, you could have the answer from the last one, the Colombian exchange, 79% uh, of people said that they had never heard of it. So um, you're bringing some knowledge their way. All right, our questions are starting. And I, might, I might recommend, by the way, um, I learned a lot about that from the great books by Charles Mann, 1491 and 1493. These are about the Americas before and after Columbus's voyage. And they are eye popping. I mean, it's just incredible what we're learning with high tech technology like ground penetrating radar about how many people were living here, what it was like. I mean, the fact that the Amazon was probably a managed garden, managed by humans and not just a jungle. So I really recommend those two books by Charles Mann to anybody who's interested in that, that idea. Wow. They're, they're very readable and he's kind of funny too. Um, all right, so our first question uh, wants to remain anonymous. Did they build the missions on the fault lines just by accident or did the Native Americans give them ideas? 
<laughs> I guess if they'd, if they'd known, they might have. No, I, w I guess what I was trying to say is that the fault is near the coast and the missions needed, needed to be near the coast. And, and so they ended up being in, near the fault really because California was settled from the sea because the presidios were established at the four safe anchorages or ports that were possible to establish on the California coast, San Diego, Santa Barbara, Monterey, and San Francisco, because they were trying to guard against incursions uh, from the other colonial powers like England and Russia. And once you had the presidios there, then of course the missions were established to support the presidios and to create settlements around them and to help settle and populate California. Spain had to uh, sort of make citizens out of the Indians because there weren't enough Spaniards or Mexicans to come up and settle all to California. It was a very remote place and nobody wanted to spend the rest of their life at a remote place or very few. So uh, anyway, that's why they were near the coast because they were defensive facilities, the presidios were. Thank you. Our guests must have earthquakes on the brain. We have another <laughs> earthquake related question. Um, can you elaborate more on the earthquake retrofitting process for the missions. Do you know more about that? You know, um, I think that, the, that John Johnson would, might know a lot about this. And there's a California Mission Foundation that's based in Santa Barbara, and they support a lot of that work. But the, the most that I learned about it really was from going on the website for Mission San Luis Rey de Francia, because they did, I think, one of the most major retrofits. And it's really about you know how we, we have frame houses where all the wooden pieces of the frame are connected and in California now we have to have these earthquake safe, what are they called? The Simpson strong walls, Ed? Yeah. Um, you know, we have to have a very strong framework before we ever put stucco or drywall or anything on a house. Well, the missions didn't have that. So if you shake a building that is made of unreinforced masonry with no steel in it, the bricks are probably gonna, or the stones are probably going to collapse. So what they do is they go and drill down uh, through those walls, as I showed in that one picture, and they they retrofit I you know steel into the building and connect it all together, so it's as if they create a reinforced masonry building where there was none. And if you go on the website for San Luis Rey, they have some really neat pictures of of the, that process. Is that one of the only missions that have that have done that so far, or you no? Know, many of them. Oh, no, they've had to do it to a lot of them. A uh, mission in San Miguel, just up north of Paso Robles, had earthquake damage just not too many years ago. They've most of them have been damaged. Interestingly, because we all know about the great earthquake of San Francisco and fire of 1906, Little Mission Dolores in San Francisco is the only mission that was never destroyed by an earthquake. <laughs> And it's all, all, also the only mission era building in San Francisco that survived, that is surviving today. All right, we have a couple more coming through. Um, was Catholicism thought as of a science in saving the natives in the area, savings in quote? Well, you know, as, as I said, we have true believers today. I mean, back, you know, in, in pre-enlightenment thinking, you know, religious organizations like the Catholic Church, for example, really promulgated this idea that everyone had to believe the same thing and that it was really bad if you didn't, if you weren't saved, if you didn't accept the Catholic faith. And they sincerely believed, I mean, people were trained from childhood to believe that this was the only way that your soul would be saved. And so the, the, the Catholic Church promoted a lot of this colonization of the new world and they sort of covered for all of it really was evangelizing and saving the souls of so many people who had not been introduced you know to Christianity of course they were exploiting all the resources and labor of the Americas but it there was really nothing scientific about it in fact what's ironic is that Cal California was the tail end of the Spanish Empire and the um you know Jose de Galvez, who was the visitor general, general or the head of New Spain at the time, was an Enlightenment era thinker. He studied at the University of Salamanca. He was an attorney. He was very well read and intellectual. And he was absolutely opposed to using Franciscan missionaries to evangelize and settle Alta California. He imagined a more modern society up there. But the, the, the reality was for him is that they needed to secure those ports because the Russians were coming, the English were exploring the coast, and all they, they just didn't have enough people to settle Alta California, so they had to send the missionaries to make uh, Spanish citizens of the Indians. But it, that was at the tail end of, of that type of thinking, and it changed even during the mission era. 
that you, you they, they just people just believed you had to all believe the same way. I mean, I think there are parts of the world today where people think you have to all believe the same thing, right? Yeah. Next Wonder. question is, what mission do you recommend as a must see? Well, uh, because you're so unlikely just to bump into it, the one that's on the screen right now, uh, in my book, and and uh, I'd be glad to send you anybody information if you don't don't want to buy the book, but. When you visit Mission San Antonio de Padua, there's a great place to stay right near it called the Hearst Hacienda. Before Julia Morgan designed Hearst Castle for William Randolph Hearst, she designed a hunting lodge for him on his ranch, which this mission ended up being on. And that hunting lodge is called the Hacienda or the Hearst Hacienda. And it's just within a mile or so of the mission. It looks a lot like a mission. It's a beautiful building. And you can stay there if you go on the website uh, for the Hearst Hacienda. It's run by the military. It's very basic, but it's a beautiful building. You have to eat kind of packaged breakfast. But when you stay overnight there, and I think the mission even has some overnight rooms now in their Padres quarters, but this is such a magical place in the Valley of the Oaks. And if you go in nice weather, like in the spring or the fall, you can drive through the Valley of the Oaks over the Santa Lucia Mountains on the Nascimento Ferguson Road, and you get to Big Sur on the other side in about how long? An hour and a half? It's a fabulous drive. So that's a wonderful, wonderful thing to do and a great mission to visit. After you've stayed overnight and passed the Robles and had some wine and great food. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a lovely adventure, yes. <laughs> it is. <laughs> All right, Janet, I think that ends the question and answer portion for Thank you. today. Um, Thank you very much, everybody. Really appreciate it. Thank you it. so much, Janet. This was an amazing talk. I've been looking forward to it and you're such a charismatic speaker. So thank you for joining us. Thank you, Stephanie. Thanks. Love everybody. Bye. So next month, um, we have Dr. Diana Aria from UC Santa Barbara, and um, it seems like we're going back to um, back to school because today was history and science, and uh, next month is the science of reading and how we should better read science um, and how it uh, how the two interconnect um, and actually how our generations are forming the way we learn and teach others how to read. So it's gonna be a fantastic science pub. We will see you all next month. Take care everyone and um, we'll see you in October. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>